Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Welcome to everybody joining us this morning in person, on Zoom, or on YouTube later on. This has been a pretty exhausting week. I've, I've been talking to many of you, you know, throughout the week and before, and this has been a tiring week ac across the country, especially for Jewish students, especially for those engaged with college life, for those who have children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, community friends on, on campus. Um, Definitely one of the harder weeks that I think our Jewish students have experienced, seeing claims and cheers for intifada across campuses, and me personally, and I can only imagine for the students being shouted out out of cars just for walking through campus with a kippah on. And I was thinking about this this week, and one of the ironies is that Monday morning was the seventh day of Passover, which traditionally is the day that the sea split and the day that the final exodus happened from Egypt. After the week-long running away, we have this, of course, famous scene that we read about last week where the Israelites are, have their back to the sea and the encroaching Egyptian army. And the seventh day of Passover is the celebration of that sea splitting. And on Monday morning, as I got ready to host a lunch for a couple of coworkers and friends, is when we found out that the anti-Israel encampment came to campus here in Orange County. And so it was quite the strange uh, trying to be happy in, in Chag, right? We say that v'samachta b'chagacha, right? On holidays, you're supposed to be happy. And yet it felt that in some way there wasn't able to be the joy of the exodus as I biked onto campus and saw that students were scared, they were angry, they didn't know what was happening. And I very much felt that we were still collectively as a people still in Egypt. And I know that Passover ended, ended a couple days ago, but in my head I'm still in that mental place of, of being in Egypt on a personal level. One of the things that I, we've talked about in past years is the name Mitzrayim, the Hebrew name for Egypt, comes from the word Metzar, or comes from the root of the word Tsar. And Metzar means a dire strait or a dangerous place. We say in Hala, Min HaMetzar Karatiya. From my place of difficulty, I called out to God, right? The word tsar is used all over the Tanakh to refer to something bitter and evil, right? When Esther accuses Haman of, of having his plot to kill the Jews, she points to him, ish tsar be'oyev, right? This is a evil and bitter man. And when the Haggadah tells us that in every generation, we have an obligation to see ourselves as being freed from Egypt, it's really that personal obligation of finding a way in the course of what seems like a bitter place and what seems like a dangerous place um, to move forward. And so the question that I was thinking about this week is what happens when it's really difficult to leave Egypt, right? Passover's over. It ended a couple days ago. I know Rabbi Miriam told me that she had matzah brai for breakfast this morning. I'm sorry for, uh, for outing you. Um, <laughs> But for, for people that, that want to be done with Passover, I particularly do not want to be eating matzah fry um, still, still for breakfast, what happens when it's difficult to leave Egypt? Um, and my mind kept on coming back to, to a source and really an, an interesting debate that I want to um, share with you. We'll get the um, sources up in a minute. If we scroll to the top, perfect. Don't be afraid. I know that was a lot of sources there. It was. <laughs> I, w I was joking to Rabbi Miriam that because uh, Mark and Lila, our two uh, regulars, aren't here to uh, you know, show me the time, it means I can speak for a couple hours, but I'm, I'm, d I'm totally kidding. Um, but we, we have this fascinating idea, um, and Rashi, the famous medieval French sage, already discusses this when we come to the plagues. So I know that you know, the plagues were about a week and a half ago during the Seder, um, but just a reminder, there were ten plagues that God put onto the Egyptians, and number nine was darkness. And... Rashi, along with a lot of the medieval commentators, a lot of when you discuss this with, you know, children for the first time, I remember discussing this with the teenagers two years ago, and they're, you're reading through all the plagues and you get to darkness and somebody inevitably says, well, what's so bad about darkness, right? I mean, I can understand why having hundreds of thousands of locusts swarm down and hail and, you know, death of the firstborn, you know, doesn't sound too great, um, but yet hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, ran to the eclipse for a chance to see darkness during the day. And as far as I know, all the people who went to the eclipse, nothing terrible happened to them. 
during, during the eclipse. And so what is, what is darkness doing here? Um, and Rashi provides us an interesting answer um, that starts a really, a really interesting discussion. So Rashi asks, why did God bring darkness upon them? And so he plays with a couple of answers, and then ultimately he lands on, because there were wicked people among the Israelites of that generation who had no desire to leave Egypt. And these people died during the three days of darkness so that the Egyptians might not see their destruction and say, see, the Israelites too have been struck in as we have. So Rashi tells us a, a radical thing, right? You think, Rashi might say, that the point of the plague of darkness was to yet again punish the Egyptians, right? We're very fond of that in the plagues. And Rashi says, actually, plague number nine was to punish people in the community, right? God had to take care of, in some way, people who didn't want to leave Egypt, right? It wouldn't look good for the community if hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people were getting ready to be on their way out, and there were people standing there saying, we actually want to stay in Egypt. And so Rashi is putting the pieces together in some way and suggesting that's the reason for darkness. Um, Rashi goes on a little bit more. If we scroll down, there's a verse that that's sort of vague that happens right after the Exodus. And I'll read it in, in Hebrew first and then in English, because the Hebrew is the, the vague part, right? So it says, Vayisev Elohim et ha'am, God led the people in a roundabout way, derech bar yamsuf, right, around the desert and the yamsuf, and then this word that nobody can figure out what it means, v'chamushim alu b'nei Yisrael me'eret Mitzrayim, the, the Israelites were chamushim. Um, and I'm curious for the modern uh, Israel speakers to take a crack at, at what chamushim is, but a lot of the commentators spend a lot of time trying to figure out this is not a word that is oftentimes used in the Tanakh. And so Rashi, again, our uh, medieval commentator, takes an initial crack, if we slow, scroll down a little more, and he says the word chamushim means provided with weapons, right? So he says, okay, you know, you don't have to go into all these interesting interpretations. Chamushim means in some way armed. But then he offers you an additional explanation. Another explanation of chamushim is that only one in five, and other versions say only one in 500, chamesh, the word for five in Hebrew, went forth from Egypt. And four parts of the people died during the three days of darkness because they were unworthy of being delivered. Rashi's using this vague word that sounds like five to come up with this idea, right, based on earlier midrashic sources, but to bring this idea forward that actually leaving Egypt wasn't this easy thing. Right? It wasn't this thing where Moses comes and says, okay, we're leaving tomorrow, and everybody you know, said, okay, great, we've been waiting for this. It was actually a really tough process, such a tough process that 80%, or if you go with the 1 in 500, I'm not going to try to do uh, math on the fly, 0.05%, someone could fact check me on that, um, percent of the people actually wanted to leave, and the other ones in some way, they were unable to leave Egypt for whatever reason. Now, the Ibn Ezra, Rashi's, um, I'll say his Spanish counterpart, right? If, if, if a, a little uh, medieval biblical commentator is one-on-one, -on -one, is the Ashkenazi rabbis that were in France and in England and Germany at the time. They were very fond of quoting Talmud and Midrash as a way of explaining the Torah, whereas the rabbis in Spain oftentimes argued against the uh, Talmudic interpretations. And so Ibn Ezra is going to... Uh, punch back hard against Rashi, right? He, he does not like this explanation that seems to say that 80% of the Israelites were these wicked people that sided with the Egyptians. So he says as follows. In Midrash says one in five left. This is a lone opinion which is debated and not at all a received tradition. So Ibn Ezra, writing in Spain in the 1100s, says, big deal, right? You found one source, right? To, uh, you know, there's lots of sources, is what he's saying. We have already had enough grief uh, from the Muslim scholars who say, how is it possible that 55 men who went down to Egypt with Jacob could be the ancestors in just 200 years of 600,000 men over the age of 20, right? So he says, first of all, we have a mathematical problem, right? There weren't that many Israelites who went down to Egypt, right? If we look at the end of the book of Genesis, Jacob goes down with a family of 70. The math doesn't really add up if you account for, you know, what, seven generations or eight generations over 200 years, that doesn't equate to having 600,000 males. So if now you're telling me there were five times that, we have a much bigger math problem. But that isn't really what's bothering him. What's really bothering him is as follows. In every plague that consumed Egypt, the Jews were spared. Most of the Egyptians' cattle died during the plague of cattle disease, Deber, 
while not one of the Jews' cattle died. In the plague of the firstborn, not a single Jew died. In the plague of darkness, the Torah says, there was light for all the Jews. During the plagues in which Egyptians died, Jews did not die. So, during a plague darkness in which no Egyptian died, how could all of the Jews die until only one in five survived? Besides, that would mean the Jews did not have light in their home, but the darkness of disease and the pitch black of death. So he's saying this makes no sense. This doesn't make sense from a mathematical perspective. This idea contradicts the Torah. The Torah explicitly tells us the Jews had light, the Egyptians didn't have light. And he says as follows, since only a tiny part was left from a huge nation, this would not have been a redemption for the Jews, but a sick evil. He says if it's true that 80% of the Jews actually decided to stay in Egypt in some way, this wouldn't be a celebration. This would actually be a, be a practice of mourning. And actually, based off of this, I, I took this source out, but I think it's, uh, it's interesting. Later Hasidic rabbis interpret the four cups that we have at the Seder not as a celebratory cup, but almost as a remembrance, a you know, pouring one out for the four-fifths of Jews who are left behind with the fifth, fifth cup, the cup of Elijah, being the actual cup of redemption, the one-fifth who left. But the Ibn Ezra doesn't like that interpretation. And so the Ibn Ezra at the end says, the whole thing is a midrash, don't rely on it, right? So ignore this. Maybe the one who said it at the outset had a hidden reason, right? Don't take Rashi too literally. Don't take the midrash too literally. So I thought about this, you know, okay, a medieval rabbi tells you there's a good hidden reason, right? Start your own uh, treasure hunt to try to figure out, you know, what could this hidden reason be? Um, and I came up with an idea. I, I couldn't find any other sources that said this, but what if this midrash is not talking about externally, but it's talking about internally, right? That in every one of us, every time we're in a hard place, there's actually a majority of ourselves that find it really difficult to get ourselves mentally out of a place of, of tsar, right? To actually go through on our own internal exodus, our own process from going from Egypt through the desert to the Holy Land. That's not easy. And at all times, we have that majority of ourselves, right? Call it the, you know, the, the devil angel there. Call it, you know, the whispers in our head telling us, you know, it's much easier to just sit around and be upset about this than actually try to go do something. Maybe I should just spend another day, you know, in metaphorical Egypt. And perhaps what the Ibn Ezra is, is alluding to is that the Midrash saying four-fifths of Jews got left behind is that we actually have to leave those voices in our own head behind. Those doomsdayist voices that say, this is terrible, what's going to happen? Is this the end of Jewish life in America? Is this the end of American support for Israel? Those voices are there, and those voices might even be the four-fifths. But to actually get there, we need to leave this behind in some way. So I kept looking a little bit and found another great story that the Talmud quotes just to uh, discuss what the Talmud is, is basing off of. The sixth, seventh day of Passover, right, this first day that I learned about the encampments, we read in the Torah that morning the story of Pharaoh and the Egyptians drawing near. So Exodus 14 reads as follows. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites caught sight of the Egyptians advancing towards them. Greatly frightened, the Israelites cried out to God, and they said to Moses, Was it for want of graves in Egypt that you brought us out to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us be, and we will serve the Egyptians, for it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Have no fear, stand by, and witness the deliverance which God will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. God will battle for you. You hold your peace. Then God said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. Now, this paragraph makes no sense. If I was an English teacher grading this for uh, consistency, I don't really know what's going on here. Because God, in the end, is talking to Moses about crying out to him, but Moses is never talking to God, and it kind of seems like Moses' message back to the people have nothing really to do with what the people wanted. Moses is saying, God will batter for you, hold your peace. There's a lot of inconsistencies here, which opens the door to great midrashic interpretation. And so the rabbis in the Jerusalem Talmud tell us as follows. If we scroll down a little bit more. The rabbis tell us that when the Israelites were chased by the Egyptians to the sea, they formed into four groups. So what do you know? 
The Jews are under attack by an external army, and we can't agree on what to do about it, right? There were four groups that broke out at the desert. One group says, it's over. Let's jump in the sea, right? This is the end, right? It's been a good run. It's been a nice week of celebrating our national identity, Passover, but let's jump into the sea. A second group says, let's just, let's just call it quits. Let's just go back to Egypt. Egypt wasn't so bad. We can go back to not having our own autonomy. We can go back to living in the land of Egypt. And a third say, why don't we fight? Let's pick up arms. Well, a fourth said, you guys all have it wrong. Let's just pray. Let's be a little bit more devoted. And so Moshe Rabbeinu answered them according to the command of God. And so this is the Midrash is going line by line in the Torah. To those who said, let us leap in the sea, Moses said, stand by and behold the salvation of God. There is no reason for collective suicide because God's salvation will soon be seen. To the group who said, let us return to Egypt, Moses said, you'll never see them again. There's not an Egypt to worry about. To those who said, let us fight Pharaoh, Moses said, God will do battle for you. And to those who said, let us cry out and pray, Moses said, and you should hold your peace. There is no need even to cry out and pray. So Moses turns to God. Wait, what then should be done? And God's answer to Moses comes in the next verse. Speak to the Israelites and let them continue on ahead. When there's so much craziness, oftentimes, we, we get ourselves caught into all these, these questions about what is the right way to respond? Is this the end of Jewish life? How do we support Jewish students? All of these things that oftentimes paralyze us in a, a, a series of bad choices. I was talking to a bunch of you just before services today, and, and everyone said, well, there's no good option. Um, and there was no good option at the sea. Um, and what I think the rabbis are telling us is that at a certain point, despite the fact that there's no good options, despite the fact that it seems scary whatever way we turn, there's a hundred different ways that we can summarize the challenges facing us today, whether we want to talk about institutions or the academy or politics or geopolitics, there's a hundred different things that can keep us back emotionally, psychologically, intellectually as a community keep in Egypt. But what the Torah is telling us is that at all costs, you have to continue to go forward. That the whole point of Passover, to some extent, is despite the difficulty, there's no choice but to march forward. And if you march forward, you never know what will happen. And so I wanted to conclude with just one last story um, that I found really powerful, that I actually shared at my Passover Seder this year. I, I hadn't seen the story before. Perhaps um, others ha had seen this. This was written by a Holocaust survivor who was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And this is in his memoirs of, of the Warsaw Ghetto. He survived the Holocaust. He ended up moving to Israel and writing an autobiography about his time in the Warsaw Ghetto and his time in the camps. And here is what he talks about. He says, the first evening of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto coincided with the first night of Passover, right? This was not, this was not an accident. One of the Jewish fighters was wandering about in search of flashlights when he came upon the home of Rabbi Maisel. And now we're getting from the first person perspective of his friend. When I entered the room, I suddenly realized that this was the first night Seder. The room looked as if it had been hit by a hurricane. Bedding was everywhere, cha chairs laid overturned. The floor was strewn with household objects. The window panes were gone. It had all happened the day before, during the day, before the inhabitants of the room returned from the bunker. Amidst this destruction, the table in the center of the room looked incongruous, with glasses filled with wine, with the family seated around the rabbi, reading the Haggadah. His reading was punctured by explosions and the rattling of machine guns. The faces of the family around the table were lit by the red light from the burning buildings nearby. As I was leaving, the rabbi bade me farewell and wished me much success. He was old and broken, he told me. But we, the young people, must not give up, and God would help us. Shabbat shalom.